Kia ora Church family, uh, it is so good to be with you. I just wanted to make a shout out and say thanks to all those people that helped and also that came to experience our Easter art walk around. It was uh, a huge success with heaps of people coming through and our prayer is that, uh, that you engaged in the gospel message in a way that was life-giving for you. Hey, this morning we don't have our usual uh, 9.45 online service. Instead, we are going to be in-house at church uh, doing a bit of an engaging family service this morning and so if you're at home watching instead we've got one of the sermons from uh, the Baptist Union that they pre-recorded and uh, hopefully it's life-giving for you it's enriching for you and that it's still a great time for you at home encountering Jesus through his word so bless your heaps and uh, we look forward to being back with you on May the 1st Kia to everyone. It is a privilege to be with you here this morning. My name is Michael Rhodes and I'm a lecturer in Old Testament at Cary Baptist College and I'm happy to be with you virtually and unpacking the Word of God with the people of God even from far away. The text I want us to explore this morning comes from 1 John 3, 1 through 30. This is how it reads in the NIV. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, but what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Have you ever had a loved one struggle with Alzheimer's or serious dementia? This last year, I lost both my grandfather and my aunt to Alzheimer's. These debilitating diseases, they strike at the heart of one of our most precious faculties, the ability to remember. When we have a loved one struggling with Alzheimer's in the early stages, any of us can relate. We've lost our keys. We've forgot where we parked our car. But as the disease progresses, eventually we watch our loved ones struggle to answer some of life's most basic questions. Questions like, who am I? Where am I? When am I? When these questions become impossible, our loved ones often feel alienated, not only from us, but even from themselves. Brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you this morning that being a disciple of Jesus requires us to be able to answer the questions, who am I, where am I, when am I? And I want to suggest to you that far too often in the church, we find ourselves alienated from these questions, unable to answer these most basic fundamental queries. And just as Alzheimer's deeply damages its victim's ability to function, so our inability to remember who we are, where we are, when we are as disciples, hinders our lives as followers of Jesus. We're still, while my grandfather and aunt or your loved ones who suffer from Alzheimer's suffer as victims, sometimes we in the church fail to remember the answers to these questions because we've intentionally forgotten them, because we've resisted the answers to these questions, resisted what they mean for us in our ongoing life with Jesus. But the good news is, I think, that 1 John 3, 1 through 3 offers us a program for remembering, a statement about who we are and where we are and when we are in our lives as disciples of Jesus. And by paying attention to these, this text, we can receive God's invitation to be disciples who know where we are and when we are and where we are today. So let's consider how John might help us answer these questions. First, who am I? John answers this question in 3, 1 through 3, right out of the gate. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. John begins by drawing our attention to this world-reshaping reality that we are God's children. In just the previous verse, John had made it clear that being a child of God is a deeply moral reality. He told us that 
if you know that God is righteous or just, you know that everyone who practices righteousness or justice has been born of God in 1 John 2, 29. But now John looks at us and says, we are God's children. And because of that, we share the, the moral DNA of our heavenly father. And John doesn't just draw our attention to the fact that we are God's children. He also draws our attention to the source of this identity as God's sons and daughters. Behold, John says, look at, pay attention to, see what sort of love the Father has given that we should be called children of God. You see, it is the overwhelming love of God that has made us his children. Our identity, the deepest answer to our questions, who are we, who am I, are grounded in the lavish, overwhelming, indescribable, unquenchable love of God the Father, a love that he has for us, a love that has made us really and truly his sons and daughters. That's the answer to the question, who are we? But secondly, where are we? Where am I? John immediately reminds us of the importance of knowing where we are by telling us the reason the world didn't know Jesus is that it, or the reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know Jesus. So we're in a world that doesn't recognize us because it didn't recognize Jesus. But what does John mean by this language of us being in the world? It's actually a really hard question to answer because John seems to use in his gospel and in his letters this language of the world in a number of different ways. Most basically, John makes it clear, for instance, in John's gospel, that the world is God's good creation. God's good creation that he loves and that he made as the creator. But at the same time, what John emphasizes in this letter, oftentimes, is that this good world is also the site of a conflict between God and God's enemy, the usurper, the devil. Indeed, in 1 John 5.18, John will go so far as to declare that while we have been born of God, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So the world is God's good creation, but it's also a battlefield. And John sees all of humanity caught up in the conflict. That's why for John, humans don't start out in some kind of unclaimed, uncommitted, merely human family, and then make some sort of neutral decision about whether or not to become God's children. No, as John says explicitly in 310, those who are not God's children are children of the devil, children of the world. It's alarming language, but John seems to be saying that the answer to the question, where are we, is that we are in God's good world gone wrong because of human sin and weakness, a world that is now under the hostile, violent influence of the devil, God's enemy. Yet for John, this reality of the world still isn't the full final answer to where we are for, for, as disciples. But because for John, the most fundamental answer to the question, where are we, is that we are in the world that God created, the world that, the, that human sin and the devil have corrupted, but also the world that God so loved that he gave his son Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal, abundant life. That's why John can declare that the Father sent the Son to destroy the works of the devil and provide a covering for our sins. So where are we? We are in the world that God has made and that God has come to rescue in Jesus. The world that God loves so much that he would not give up on it. A world that God is redeeming including redeeming all those who through faith in him, he gives the right to become sons and daughters of God. That's where we are as disciples of Jesus. But when are we? What time is it for us disciples of Jesus? John also addresses this question. Brothers, John says, we are God's children now, but what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. 
Here, John represents the reality that while disciples of Jesus are already God's children, there is a fuller revelation of what we will be that awaits Jesus' return. That fuller revelation is both the final and full vision of Jesus. We will see him as he is and the fuller and more final revelation of who we are, we will be like him. So John tells us that the answer to the question, when are disciples, is that we disciples are those who have been transformed by Jesus, and yet await a fuller transformation that we cannot fully imagine, that will come when Jesus returns, when we will see him as he is. And we will be made fully like him, fully like our beloved Lord. That's how John 3, 1 and 2 answers the questions. Who are we as disciples? Where are we as disciples? When are we as disciples? But what does that mean for us in the meantime, while we await the return of King Jesus? John also answers this question. You see, not only does John tell us that we are children of God, whom God has liberated from the power of sin and death and the devil, but who God will transform to be like Jesus when he returns. Not only does John tell us that we are children of the devil, lost in darkness, going nowhere apart from the rescuing, lavish, gracious love of God, utterly and completely and totally dependent on Jesus' saving, rescuing, transforming work in our lives. John also tells us what we're to be about in the here and now. But what he says may strike us as strange. Everyone who has this hope purifies themselves as he, that is Jesus, is pure. Now, hold on. If you've been tracking John's line of thought, that seems strange. Maybe even like heretical. Surely it's Jesus who does the purifying. It's God who does the transforming. That's what John's been emphasizing. Surely all we have to do is receive the good news and allow God to do his transforming work for, in our lives. But not so for John. No, for John, as the late John Webster put it, God's liberating love changes human lives by altering the conditions that they exist under. God's liberating love frees us to actively and energetically seek to become like Jesus while we await his return. Indeed, this is the heart of discipleship. Now, of course, if Christ had not given us rebirth through his world rescue operation, which will only be finished fully when he returns, genuine discipleship, obedience, a life of sanctified love is impossible, would be impossible. But because of God's intervening, rescuing, liberating love, lives of righteousness and justice, lives of seeking to become like Jesus, purifying ourselves as he is pure, discipleship suddenly becomes a glorious possibility. Now, I want to make clear in all of this that I'm not saying that our neighbors apart from Jesus never get anything right or that they are our enemies or that we shouldn't work with them in various ways, not at all. We know that's not what John means because John tells us in his gospel about how Jesus interacts with people who haven't yet started following him. And and Jesus treats people who haven't yet started following him with dignity and love and respect. But it does mean that genuine discipleship, the work of following Jesus and becoming like Jesus, is genuinely possible only when we have been made into children of God by God's lavish intervening love. But having been made children of God, we are invited to embrace that discipleship task with all of our hearts and all of our lives and all of our minds and all of our strengths. Discipleship for John, I suggest, is our active passionate, committed, seeking and striving to become what we are in Christ now and what we will be in Christ in full when he returns. This means that if we ever thought discipleship was about 
passively sitting around waiting for God to change us or simply thinking about with our brains what he's done for us, John blows all that up. God has made you his son or daughter out of his sheer, gracious, unexpected love, rescuing you out of the world of sin, death, and the devil, and promising to transform you at his return. And because of this, you and I can get off the couch and get to work, seeking the purity that characterizes God's own life. And not for our own sakes, of course, but to bring glory to Jesus' name and to draw people to our loving Lord. How do we do this? John gives us all sorts of ideas in his letter of what this purifying ourselves as Jesus is pure while we await his return. John points to the importance of community and repentance of brotherly love. But I want to highlight one specific thing that John talks about in this letter. One way that we participate in the life of discipleship. And that's through imitating Jesus's sacrificial, self-giving love. This is the message that we heard from the beginning, John says, just a few verses later in chapter three, that we should love one another. To do otherwise, John says, is to abide in death, to resist who we are and where we are and when we are as disciples of Jesus. But how do we know what abiding in love looks like, what loving our neighbor looks like? John points us to Jesus's self-sacrifice on the cross. 1 John 3.16 puts it this way. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Of course, we can love the brothers and sisters in all sorts of ways, but it's telling to me that in 1 John 3.17, we get the only concrete, specific application of this kind of love in the entire letter, and the only specific, concrete application that John gives in this entire letter is about caring for those who are poor. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need, yet closes their hearts against him, how does God's love abide in him? Isn't it interesting? John suggests here that if we're not actively opening our hearts rather than closing them, when confronted with the physical and social and economic needs of our brothers and sisters, we may be living as disciples who've forgotten who we are, where we are, and when we are in Jesus. I think this is a word for us today, brothers and sisters. You see, we live in a world filled with the cries of brothers and sisters in need. We live in a world where where refugees and and, and people who've been incarcerated and, and those with disabilities and people of other ethnic backgrounds than our own are constantly being excluded and marginalized, constantly crying out, not least among our own brothers and sisters in the faith. We live in a world filled with the cries of the suffering, and we live in a world where the people of God have often shut our hearts in the face of those cries. I don't know what that looks like in your world, in Aotearoa. I know what it looks like here in the southern part of the United States. So often, the, the church that I have been a part of, our long history just as a, for instance, has been a history of closing our hearts to the outcry of our black and brown brothers and sisters, so often oppressed on this soil. But even today, every single day, you and I face the temptation to shut our hearts, to close down our affections, and therefore close down our hands and our lives from our brothers and sisters who are crying out at borders and in prison cells, those living in slums and under overpasses, those broken and hurting in our pews. And when we do this, John suggests, we are not failing to keep in step with the times. We are not failing to live up to some social, you know, uh, agenda of the culture. No, we are failing to live as disciples of King Jesus. We are failing to live as followers of the one who so loved us that he gave himself on the cross for our sins. We are living like people who can no longer answer the most basic questions of our discipleship lives. 
Who are we? Where are we? When are we? The good news of the gospel, brothers and sisters, is that while we were yet sinners, God became one of us. God, out of the overflow of his lavish love in Jesus, made us sons and daughters, is reclaiming his good world and promises to return and transform us fully at that time. And that good King Jesus has sent us out in the world to actively seek to live as his disciples, purifying ourselves as he is pure, and not least, by embracing lives of radical self-offering love, and especially by offering that self-sacrificial love to the orphan and the immigrant and the widow and the refugee and the poor. Brothers and sisters, King Jesus is among us this morning. It is, his, it is this King whose love gives us rebirth and invites us to worship him today, to repent of our shortcomings, to receive his grace afresh, and to commit to living lives as disciples, seeking purity and conformity to his own sacrificial example, even as we await his return. Let us go to him this morning, brothers and sisters. Let us go to Jesus this morning, and let us find him transforming us and inviting, enabling us to follow him, not only today, but every day, not only here and in this place, but throughout his world. Amen.